the word of the Lord, Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. everyone. Uh, my name is Corey. I'm the lead pastor here at City Church in the Heights. At this point in our digital service, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And we say this each week, but we want to make sure that we keep saying it. We pray as a way of showing our dependence upon the Lord's provision uh, for us as individuals and our church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we come to you uh, just in gratitude, Father, particularly as we consider uh, the passage this morning from, from the Gospel of John about your love for us and your giving of your love for us in the life 
and death and resurrection of Christ. And so, Lord, we are grateful for that. And, Lord, we pray that we, as your people, uh, Father, would respond to your love in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. Lord, that we have services like this as a way of of responding to you, that you have shown your grace to us, and we want to respond in worship and celebration of that. And so, Lord, we uh, pray for the work of this church. Father, we pray for our sister churches throughout uh, the Cleveland area, and we're thankful for uh, their witness to the gospel. Uh, Father, we are particularly thankful for uh, City Church on the near west side and their faithful ministry in the gospel, and so we're grateful uh, for that. Lord, we're grateful for the privilege it is to partner with Jeremy and Tiffany in D.C. And, and Pete and Kara and Pete and Lindsay and Faith in Scotland and Muhammad and Isabel in West Africa. And Lord, we know that uh, they labor uh, just as we do among so many people that need to hear the good news, the beautiful gospel message that you have sent Christ as evidence of your love. And so, Lord, we pray that this message would go forth in our context and their context. But we pray that the nations would hear of your love for them, the love that you have made known through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so, Father, we want to celebrate that this morning. We want to live faithfully under that and in response to it. So, Lord, we commit these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture reading is from John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. 
This is the word of the Lord. Who is Jesus? That's the question we have been considering the last several weeks. It's a very important question because there are so many different ideas and opinions uh, in our culture and society about uh, answering this question of who Jesus is. And so what we've been trying to do the last several weeks is simply consider who Jesus is in light of his own words, in light of his own testimony, in light of uh, the eyewitness accounts of those who were part of his ministry, who lived with him and among him and who heard his teachings. And so what we've been doing is considering this in the Gospel of John. Now, John was one of the disciples of Jesus, and he wrote uh, a gospel for the purpose of helping us know and understand who Jesus is. And so as we consider this question this week, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 16 through 21 of chapter 3, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21, and considering this question of the idea of love. And what we're going to see is that one of the ways to answer this question of who Jesus is is by seeing he is the evidence of God's love. And when we consider this question of what is love, uh, it's a common uh, thing that's often asked of, of what, what love even is. I think about a story that my father-in-law often tells that when he was uh, dating, who came to be my, my mother's mom, my, my uh, grandmother, uh, when he was dating her, he approached her father about marrying her and uh, said that he wanted to marry her and uh, her father's response was well do you love her and his response was well what is love uh, so it's amazing that he survived that encounter and and um, uh, that her father didn't uh, just take him out right there that's probably what i would have done uh, but in the lord's grace he survived and uh, is alive and so thankful for that but but it is this question of of answering what is love that this passage helps answer the question of what is love what is love according to uh, god what is love according to the work of christ and so we want to look at three things in this passage that i think will help us answer this question of what is love and how it connects to who jesus is okay so the first thing we want to consider is the declaration of god's love so the declaration of god's love and this comes just in the first phrase of this passage that we've read here in john chapter 3 verse 16 for god so loved the world now if you grew up in the church, uh, this is a verse that you have most likely heard often. It may have been one of the first verses you memorized as a, as a child if you grew up in the church. Even if you did not grow up in the church and maybe you, you've never participated in a service at all. Maybe this is the first religious service you've ever participated in. Even if that is the case, uh, there's a good chance maybe you've seen a sporting event or uh, been to something uh, or seen something on TV with someone holding up a sign that says John 3.16. If you've seen that, uh, it's referring to this verse, John 3, 16. So it could be a very familiar verse to some people. And even if it's not a familiar verse, uh, that's okay. We're going to unpack what it means right here. But for those of you that it is familiar, sometimes familiarity can result in complacency. And because a verse can become so familiar, we can uh, forget the uniqueness of this verse. And so, and really just the uniqueness of these first few words that John is saying. So what I want to do is, is in this point, is show us kind of three quick things about the uniqueness of this statement that John is making. That he is making it in a very religious, religiously pluralistic society. Uh, so in some ways, similar to our context, where there are various religious beliefs, obviously you have uh, the beliefs of the, the Jewish people, but also you have the beliefs of the Gentiles, which uh, was, was, um, was, very, was very broad. And so in this context that John is saying three things that are very important for us to be mindful of as we consider this declaration of God's love. The first one is that John is making a declaration that there is one supreme God. So when he says, for God. He is saying that he is believing in one supreme God who is ruler over all. And that in and of itself is a unique religious claim uh, that there in the in kind of world religions today, there are three monothe monotheistic religions. You have Christianity, you have Judaism, you have Islam. All three would make this claim that there is uh, one God who is the creator of the world and sovereign over the world. 
But in the context uh, that John is speaking in, obviously you have Judaism that would say that. But in the Gentile worldview, uh, this is not something that was held. So that John is making this claim uh, that for his Gentile readers uh, would be a unique claim. One that is saying that there is one God who is supreme over all. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that this one God loves. This one God loves. Now that also is a unique claim. Uh, because even in the uh, religious mindset of uh, the Gentiles, that for, for many of them influenced by uh, Greek religious thoughts, that obviously there was concepts of deities and a plurality of deities, but the idea that a one God would have love for particular people is a unique concept, because in so many of the religious beliefs, there was the understanding that the relationship between a deity and people was one of uh, kind of bartering to where the people would do something to earn favor and the deity would do some type of blessing in response to that. So this idea, again, that there's one supreme God and that this one supreme God actually has love is something that is unique. And it's unique even in religious claims uh, today. Uh, that uh, even when you look at uh, some, a major religion like Islam, the concept of God being loving is not something that is central to the Islamic uh, belief. And so here, uh, John is ex uh, exhorting this idea that there's one supreme God and the supreme God loves. Now, who is the recipient of his love? This is the third thing we see, that God loved who? The world. And this is what makes John's statement the most unique. Because in the Jewish context, there was the belief, obviously, of one supreme God and a supreme God who had love, but that love was directed toward the ethnic nation of Israel. Uh, and that, that there is a strong understanding of God having love throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and throughout the Old Testament. But it's understood that, that uh, covenant love and covenant faithfulness in the Jewish mind was directed and limited to uh, the Jewish people. And so here, John is saying, that not only is there one supreme God, and not only is this one supreme God loving, but this one supreme God has love for who? The world. And in a, in a, in a society, in a context today, where religious pluralism is something that is uh, valued so much, that it is important to hear the words of, of what John is saying and how relevant they are today that a, a common um, a thing to do in our cultural context is to reduce religions to the kind of least common denominator and say basically all religions are just the same. And here part of understanding who Jesus is is that John is making the case that Jesus is unique and the claims that Jesus is making and the claims that Christianity is making is unique, that there is no other world religion that has as its core the belief in one supreme God who has love for the nations, all the world. And when we consider this idea of who the world is, that in the Gospel of John, the idea of, of world often has negative connotations, uh, that our assumption may be, well, of course God loves us because uh, we're great people. Uh, but the, the significance of what John is saying is that he is saying uh, that God loves us in spite of who we are, that, that it's not morally neutral, that this idea of world is, is carrying the idea of a world that has rebelled against God, a world that uh, has gone against God, that, that, that has rejected God, and that John is saying that God loves this world. And so we see here that God's love in this context is not, uh, the starting point is not uh, how great human beings are and how worthy we are to be loved, but is in God's very nature and his character. This is why later uh, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, that John would say that God is love, that part of the very nature and essence of who God is is love. And an overflow of that love is that God directs that love toward us, that he directs his love uh, uh, toward us. And that when we think about that the very essence of who God is is that he is love. This is why understanding God as a triune God is so important because we can see that when we understand God as God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, that we are understanding that for eternity that God has existed in this loving relationship within the triune Godhead between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. 
And now we see in John 3 that he is allowing that love to overflow to his creation, to humanity, to the world, uh, because it's the, part of the very essence and nature of his character. Now, when we hear this, uh, there are uh, sometimes we have two different types of people. Uh, for, for some of you, you may hear this and you may think, again, of course God loves us. I mean, has he not seen who I am? Like, I'm, I'm amazing. Like, just ask me. I can tell you I'm a pretty great person. Uh, and so for, for those of us uh, who uh, that might, you might fit into that category, what you need to hear, again, is that, is that God is loving you in spite of who you are, not because of your moral righteousness, uh, but he's loving you because of his character. Now, on the other side, there are uh, some of you uh, who have no doubt who hear this statement about uh, God loving you and God loving the world, and you find it incredibly hard to believe because you see yourself as unworthy. Uh, you see yourself as unlovable, uh, and you see yourself as someone that there's no possible way that God could love me. And so what you need to hear is that, yes, God's, the starting point for God's love is his character, but also that he loves us because of the worth and value that we have. So it's true that we do not do actions that are earning God's love, but God has made each one of us in his image from conception to death that we live as human beings created in the image of God, regardless of who we are and where we live and the uh, color of our skin, what language we speak, uh, where we work, where we went to school, all of those things. Uh, it does not matter that we live in a society that constantly uh, tries to evaluate human beings based upon what they do. But God sees us for who we are and who we are are human beings created in his image. And because of that, we have value, worth, and dignity, and God is directing his love to us. Now, you may hear that and say, well, that's easy to say, but how can I know that God actually does love me? What's the evidence of that? Because words can be cheap. So are these cheap words, or are they words that are actually backed up by action? And so we see in our second point that they are backed up by action. Second point is simply this, the gift of God's love, the gift of God's love. So sticking with verse 16, we've seen that for God so loved the world, that what? That he gave his only son. So one way that you could uh, paraphrase this verse and, and what it's saying is that this is how God loved the world, that he gave his only son. So that uh, the words here are not just words, they're not just uh, feelings, they're not just emotions, but it's words in action. Because think about a uh, relationship with my wife, that if I just constantly said, oh, I love you, Jasmine, I love you, I love you, but I never actually did things to convey my love to her, then she could realistically and reasonably say, I know you say that you love me, but I actually don't see that in your actions. I don't see that in how you serve me and how you care for me, how you uh, sacrifice for me and for my good. But here we see that God is not just using words, but he's saying, not only do I love the world, I'm going to show you how much I love the world, which I'm going to give my son for the world. One commentator uh, said, summed it up in this way. He said, God loved all there was and gave all he had that God did not withhold anything, but God gave the best, that he gave himself. This is why John says in chapter 1 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus Christ is God in flesh. And so that uh, when God says that he loves the world, he is giving the world himself. He's giving the world his son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is even more significant, again, when we consider the assumption behind this gift, because the assumption in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that what? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, the assumption behind John 3, 16 is that humanity finds itself in a difficult situation, that humanity finds itself in a position of needing rescue, of needing salvation. That's the assumption behind this. Uh, Paul, the apostle Paul says this, uh, so beautifully in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, where he expands on this concept even more. He says, For while we were still weak at the right time, 
Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now the significance of that is this, that God knows our deepest, darkest sins. He knows our sinfulness. He knows our rebellion. So whatever uh, you may think some people know about you and, and, and the truth about you, that God knows even more. And sometimes we try to cover that up and, and act and, and, and say, well, we want to act like we have our lives together and we don't have any problems, we don't have any issues. But the reality is, is that, that when we look in the mirror, that we know that all of us have not lived up to our own standards of righteousness, much less God's standards of righteousness. And the beauty of the gospel is that God sees that, he knows that, and he doesn't run away, but he runs to us. That He sends Jesus Christ, his only son. He sends the best that he has, not because we have been righteous and we've done these great things to deserve it, but in spite of that, because he loves us, because he is love, and that he has sent his son to save us. And I know that it is uh, oftentimes easy to uh, look at life and have life experiences where we question the love of God. Well, if God really loves me, then why would he let this happen? Why would he let my uh, spouse die? Why would he let my child die? Why would he let me lose my job? Why would he let this pandemic happen? Why would he let injustice go on in our country? Uh, why would he let these things continue to happen? These are good, valid, and legitimate questions. And to show that they're not unique to you or me or 2020 or 2021, let's hear the words of the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 8, uh, I want to read these verses here in uh, chapter, 30, chapter 8, verses 31 through the end of the chapter in verse 39. So these verses. But the importance of listening to these verses is that it shows us that our questions that we're asking when, when we experience things, questions that are related to whether or not God loves us and whether or not it's true that God cares for us based upon the circumstances that we're experiencing, that again, we are not the first generation to ask those questions. That 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was dealing with these questions and he was writing to address them and listen to the words uh, that he says uh, when we ask, you know, uh, in spite of our circumstances or in light of our circumstances, can we really trust and believe that God loves us? Notice what he says in verse 31 of chapter 8. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also be with him gracious and graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. How does Paul answer this question? Verse 37. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Like Paul is saying, not only is... Jesus not forsaking you, and not only can he not be separated, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I consider the power of those verses. Now, what Paul is saying is because that Jesus has already come and because that God has already given us his best, that it's impossible for him to withhold smaller things. And so no circumstance or situation can undo the fact 
that 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ was born and lived a human life and was crucified on the cross and was raised on the third day as an overflow of God's love for the world. That truth cannot be undone. So this is why Paul is saying like famine and hunger and tribulations and persecution and trials and even death cannot separate us from the love of God that he has shown to us in Christ Jesus. And so it may feel sometimes that God does not love us. And our experiences may seem that that is the reality. But God has given us his word that 2,000 years continues to bear testimony and bear witness that God's love cannot be separated from us because he has given us Christ. And so this is something to celebrate. It's the evidence of God's love, the giving of Jesus Christ to us. Now finally, the third point, the response to God's love. The response to God's love. We see this in the, in the rest of the passage. I want to first address two misconceptions that often happen when it is understood that God loves the world and that Jesus died for the world and that God has given the world his son, Jesus Christ. There are two misconceptions that often take place. The first one is that people will say, well, because God loves us in John 3.16 and because uh, Jesus uh, did not come into the world to condemn the world, according to verse uh, 17, then everyone is saved. That's okay, we're all good. But there are conditions that are placed uh, upon this. And uh, what is the condition that is placed? In verse 16, we see this, and it is saying that whoever believes in him should not perish, in verse 16. And then also in uh, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. So the condition on this is the condition of belief. That God is saying, I have love for the world, and I have given my son to rescue the world. But the condition that is required for you to be rescued by his saving work is belief. Not just a mere intellectual, oh yeah, I believe that Jesus existed. But, but the belief in the New Testament is, is more closely associated with how we would use the word trust. That we are called to trust in Jesus Christ. Specifically what? That we are trusting that his life is the righteousness that we need. So that when we are called to believe in Christ, we are believing that Jesus lived a righteous life. And therefore, my standing before God is not based upon my own personal righteousness, but the righteousness that Christ has, has, has given to his people through faith. And that's the first thing, that we're believing in the righteousness of Christ. The second thing, we're, we're believing and trusting in the death of Christ, that his death was sufficient to pay the penalty for uh, the, the, the death that I deserve, and that you deserve, that we all deserve because of our sin. And that when Jesus was on the cross and he says, it is finished, that he is saying that the wrath of God directed toward the sins of his people, the atonement that is necessary, the sacrificial atonement, the propitiation for sins that is required has been satisfied. So we're trusting that Jesus accomplished that. And the third thing we're trusting is the hope of the resurrection, that Jesus on the third day raised from the from the from the from, from dead from the dead, and that he conquered death. He conquered our greatest enemy. And so therefore we have hope that this life is not the end. But we had hope that we have hope that Jesus actually is the Son of God because he conquered death. And so there's this idea that yes, God does love the world, and yes, Jesus has been sent into the world not to condemn the world, but to offer rescue and salvation. But the condition for that is belief. There is the requirement to believe. And we saw that at the end of last week's passage where Jesus is saying that he is like the serpent that Moses lifted up in the desert, in the wilderness. That all who looked to the serpent believed and were healed. And Jesus is saying, all who look to me and believe will have eternal life and will not perish. That's the first misconception. The second misconception is some would say that because God loves that it's wrong to condemn any action, that basically kind of any type of activity goes, that you shouldn't say that's wrong because God is loving. And this is uh, something that is often communicated 
uh, in the church and uh, culture at large. It's almost kind of part of the national uh, religion of the United States that because God is loving, uh, then we don't say anything is wrong. But this is not what is going on in this passage. And it's clear uh, when we look at verses uh, 18, 19, and 20, where it says, uh, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because not, he did not believe in the name of the only Son of God. So there's condemnation for those who reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God and reject his salvific work. Further, in verse 19, John offers his explanation for why he thinks there is rejection. He says, and this is the judgment. The light of the world has come into the world, and the light is Jesus Christ, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So John is very clear here. He's saying that, that God's love for the world and the giving of his son for the salvation of the world does not mean that there are not continuing acts of evil that are present in the world. And he's saying that, in fact, the desire for some people to hide in the darkness and to keep uh, evil concealed is a motivating factor for turning from Christ and rejecting Christ. He goes on to say, verse 21, for everyone who does things, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his work should be exposed. Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So when we think about this response that is being called for, uh, if you are participating in this service and you're not a Christian, the response to God's love is an invitation to believe upon Jesus Christ, to believe that you would not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life, as John says in verse 316. So that invitation is there for you. Uh, for those who have already professed faith in Christ and claim him, uh, it is a reminder of a couple of things. First of all, is that part of what Jesus does is that he pulls us out of the darkness and into the light. And it's interesting that in verse 21, that, that those who believe should be seeking to do what is true, and what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So one is a desire to seek truth, it's a desire to seek the light, but it's also a warning against any type of self-righteousness. Because one of the things that sometimes happens is that Christians uh, can often say, oh, well, I believe, and so therefore, look at me how righteous I am. But it's interesting in this passage is that even in this passage, after belief, that John is calling for a rejection of self-righteousness. That he's saying that whatever deeds you have done or whatever you're doing that is in line with the light and truth, that we want to see that. But what? See it in a way that it's been carried out in God. That it's through God that these things are happening. So even after belief, and the hope is a life that is reflecting the truth of Christ and uh, the, the, the life that Jesus calls us to, that God is saying that that life in itself is not something to be prideful about, but it's one to recognize that it's only possible because what, a, what God is doing in us and through us. So we've seen uh, the declaration of God's love in this passage. We've seen the gift of God's love, and we've seen the response of God's love. So again, my invitation to you, if you're not a Christian, is to believe upon Jesus Christ. My invitation to you, if you are a Christian, is to be mindful of the responsibility as Christians to love one another as God has loved us. How is that? God withheld no good thing from his people. He gave his best. So we think about loving one another as we are called to do. We are called to withhold no good thing. We are called to radically love one another. We are called to seek the good of one another above our own good. We are called to give others our best. And this is possible through God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful for your word, Father, that confronts us in so many ways, that pushes against the lies that Satan would fill in our minds that we're not worthy of your love, that you don't love us. Lord, your truth is light. 
and it brings light to those lies and dispels them. So, Lord, we are grateful for the love you have shown us, specifically in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And thank you, Jesus, for giving of yourself as an overflow of the triune love for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the reasons why we celebrate and receive the Lord's table each week is so that when we come to the table and we see the bread and the cup, that we are reminded that regardless of what happened this week, regardless of what circumstances we experienced and what pain we felt, that God loves us and that he has shown his love to us in the sending of his son and that Jesus' body was broken for us because of God's love, because of his love for us. So may that be, may we, may we be renewed to that truth this morning as we receive the Lord's table. If you're participating and you're not a Christian, this is an opportunity for you, instead of participating in this part, is to consider uh, what it would mean to believe upon Jesus Christ. What would it mean to trust in him in his life, death, and resurrection, that you may not perish but have everlasting and eternal life. As we receive the Lord's table, this is the body and blood of Jesus broken and shed for you.
So grateful that you have been able to participate in our digital service uh, this morning. A couple ways to exhort you. First of all, if you are participating and you want to know more about what it means to trust in Christ, to believe upon God's only son that he sent us as, his, as he loves us, uh, there is a connect card uh, in the description below. You can click on that or link in the description below. It'll take you to our website. You can fill out some information and someone from the church will reach out to you to talk more about these things. Also in the description is a link to our Zoom lobby. Uh, if you are again first time participator or have been participating a lot, you're a member here, it doesn't really matter. You just wanna talk with someone, pray with someone, talk about the service, meet other people. You can join the lobby that will, uh, join the Zoom lobby that will begin immediately following the service. What love? What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. As we scatter on mission, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you 
that we might be agents of restoration in this city and to the ends of the earth, to see all things new in Christ. Amen. Praise God.